活佛，真呀，引领真活，今天真你了。强国努力奋斗。On November the first, 1955, Mao Zedong left Beijing at the start of a tour of the country. He would visit a total of 16 cities, including Tianjin, Dezhou, and Jinan. Wherever he went, he held discussions with the local cadres and inspected factories and construction sites. A month earlier, the sixth plenary session of the CPC's Seventh Central Committee had decided to hold the Eighth National Congress of the Communist Party of China the following year. The inspection tours undertaken by Mao and the other leaders were part of the preparations for the Congress. Socialism had been established in China. The question now was: How could it be consolidated and developed at a time when the economy and culture were still relatively backward? The CPC, in the course of leading the people to meet this challenge. Gain valuable theoretical and practical experience. Back in Beijing, Mao spent 43 days listening to the work reports submitted by 35 departments of the State Council. He also carefully examined the National Planning Commission's report on progress in the second five-year plan. He heard the first of these reports at Zhongnanhai, the government compound in Beijing, on February the 14th, 1956, two days after Chinese New Year. Submitted by the third office of the State Council, it concerned the state of heavy industry. On the same day, in Moscow, the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union convened. It was a meeting that would expose shortcomings and mistakes in the way socialism was being built there. The Communist Party of China, which was still in the process of establishing socialism, paid close attention. Mao Zedong said, "Do you want to follow the detours they have made?" It was by drawing lessons from their experience that we were able to avoid certain detours in the past, and there is all the more reason for us to do so now. Referring to the lessons that could be learned from the Soviet Communist Party Congress, he stated, "The most important thing is to think independently and integrate the universal truth of Marxism-Leninism with the concrete practice of the Chinese Revolution and construction." Now that we have entered the period of socialist revolution and construction, we should carry out a second integration and explore a path for socialist construction in China. In between studying reports, Mao spent six days in succession visiting an exhibition on the machinery industry. The exhibition was being held on Yingtai, an island in the lake within the Zhongnanhai compound. The building was old, but the exhibits inside represented the most sophisticated products of Chinese industry at the time. During his afternoon visits, Mao would inspect the items carefully 
sometimes even asking for the manuals so he could learn more about them. At an enlarged meeting of the Politburo on April the 25th, 1956, and again at the Supreme State Conference held on May the 2nd, Mao Zedong delivered the speech on the 10 major relationships. In it, he said that China should, in reviewing its own experience, draw lessons from the Soviet Union. It should explore a path of building socialism that was adapted to the Chinese reality and investigate every factor that could have a positive impact on making China a powerful socialist country. On the 10 major relationships focused on economic issues, as well as certain key aspects of state politics that affected economic construction. Mao emphasized that of the 10 relationships, the most important were those between industry and agriculture, between the coastal regions and the interior, between the central and local authorities, between the state and units of production and producers, and between economic and defense construction. Through the speech, he demonstrated that the CPC had developed an initial and relatively systematic thought on how to open up the path of socialist construction. Chairman Mao would later say that the 10 major relationships put him on track to discovering a path that was suitable for China. Progress was unfolding on several fronts. In January 1956, the CPC Central Committee had convened in Beijing to discuss the issue of intellectuals. At the meeting, Zhou Enlai said that most intellectuals now belong to the working class as a result of a fundamental transformation of their collective attitude. Based on this evaluation, the CPC was able to formulate a correct policy towards intellectuals in the socialist era. On the final day of the meeting, Chairman Mao made a speech. In it, he said, what forms of revolution should we now carry out? We need to carry out a revolution in technology. It's called a technological revolution. We should engage in science, which is a revolution against stupidity and ignorance, a cultural revolution. He called on every party member to study and gain a knowledge of science. He urged them to unite with the country's intellectuals, including those who were not party members, in a struggle to help the country attain as quickly as possible the world's advanced level in science. The meeting created waves among the country's intellectuals. Inspired, they dedicated themselves to socialist construction. The country was swept by a craze to advance towards modern science. At an enlarged meeting of the Politburo in April 1956, Chairman Mao proposed a new policy aimed at encouraging a flourishing of arts and sciences. He called for letting a hundred flowers bloom and a hundred schools of thought contend. At the CPC's National Conference on Publicity Work on March the 12th the following year, he expounded on this policy. He stated that letting a hundred flowers bloom and a hundred schools of thought contend was a fundamental long-term policy, not a short-term aim. The response to the policy was enthusiastic. Well-known biologist Tan Jiajian was present when Mao made the speech. He later recalled both for China's efforts in genetics and for me personally, this policy was like a sweet shower after a long drought. It was a great support for me, something I'll never forget as long as I live. The new policy injected an unprecedented sense of vitality into artistic creation and academic work. In 1956 alone, 50 major national academic conferences were held and more than 2,000 scientific papers were published. In both cases, the number was greater than in any previous year. The 1950s and 1960s produced vast numbers of hugely popular novels, plays and films reflecting the climate of the times.
the 100 Flowers campaign, as it became known, was in tune with a country that enjoyed political stability, economic development and unity among the people. It reflected the contemporary need for a flourishing of the arts and sciences and represented the determination of Mao Zedong and the CPC Central Committee to make that happen. On September the 15th, 1956, the Communist Party of China convened its eighth National Congress. The meeting was held in the newly completed auditorium of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. Mao Zedong delivered the opening address. The speech, which comprised fewer than 1,500 words, received 32 rounds of applause. It encapsulated the burgeoning sense of unity, confidence, and belief permeating the party. Liu Xiaoqi then delivered the political report of the Central Committee. The Congress, in adopting the report, noted that China had essentially established a socialist society. However, it was still facing some serious issues. Domestically, the most pressing was the failure of economic and cultural development to progress rapidly enough to meet the people's demands. The priority for the party and the people was to focus on developing production capacity and transforming China from a backward agricultural society into an advanced industrial society as quickly as possible. In this way, the people's growing material and cultural demands could be met. When the time came to elect the 8th CPC Central Committee, Mao Zedong stressed that its composition should reflect the party's historical development. Since China was shifting its focus to construction and the economy, the committee should include significant numbers of engineers and scientists, along with cadres who were former workers. The 8th National Congress of the CPC was the first to be held after the party had gained control over the entire country. It heralded the advent of the era of comprehensive socialist construction. However, this era would witness unrest in some socialist countries in Eastern Europe. In China, several new contradictions also appeared in society. The CPC was faced with a major challenge in finding solutions to these contradictions. In November 1956, the second plenary session of the 8th CPC Central Committee convened. Drawing on the lessons learned from Eastern Europe, the meeting emphasized that in addition to ensuring the well-being of the country and people, the party must also prevent cadres from being seen as privileged and removed from the masses. The meeting decided that action was required to rectify the work style of party officials. The deliberations were extensive and took into account the lessons learned from the major international and domestic events in the past year. The outcome was that Mao Zedong thought on how to resolve the contradictions among the people began to mature. At the Supreme State Conference held at Zhongnanhai on February the 27th, 1957, Mao delivered a speech. 
on the correct handling of contradictions among the people. In it, he noted that in their nature, the contradictions among people were fundamentally different from those between the people and enemy forces. For the party, which now governed the entire country, the most important task was to use democratic means, persuasion, and education to resolve the many contradictions among people. His speech was a major theoretical landmark on the CPC's path to socialist construction. On April the 27th, 1957, the Central Committee issued the Directive on the Rectification Movement as a manifesto for a party-wide campaign targeting bureaucratism, sectarianism, and subjectivism, its aim was to improve work styles within the party. Three days later, Chairman Mao invited the leaders of the country's other democratic parties to an informal discussion. By seeking the assistance of these democratic figures, he was demonstrating how sincere the CPC was about rectifying its work style. His hope was to create a vibrant political environment in which the socialist revolution and construction could thrive. It would give rise to a structure that was centralized yet democratic, disciplined yet free, and unified yet with scope for individual expression. But as the campaign progressed, a small number of capitalists and rightists seized the opportunity to attack the CPC and the nascent socialist system. Although countermeasures were needed, the seriousness of the situation was exaggerated. As a result, there was a serious overemphasis of the anti-rightist struggle, which led to unfortunate results. Despite the leftist bias created by this struggle, the policies set by the 8th CPC National Congress for Economic Construction were still being carried out. In a display of hard work and unity, the party and the people not only completed the first five-year plan in 1957, but greatly exceeded all of its targets. Production was soaring at factories and farms across the country. The fervor with which people were building socialism reflected the pressing desire to improve China's backward economy. The belief was widespread that progress could be even faster than it had been under the first five-year plan. However, several of the country's senior leaders, lacking experience in socialist construction, had only a limited understanding of the underlying state of China's economy. The economic success led them to grow conceited and to exaggerate their own influence. Out of this situation, there emerged the Great Leap Forward and the movement to form people's communes. The mistakes committed by the leftists had serious consequences that could serve as a profound lesson for the CPC. The Central Committee and Mao Zedong decided to research the issues carefully. They would then correct the mistakes and adjust their policies accordingly. In October 1958, Mao Zedong paid another visit to the South. During many stops along the way, he talked to local cadres and learned about their situation. Although he was interested in hearing about the achievements of the Great Leap Forward and the movement to form people's communes, he also sensed that the fervor of these campaigns needed to be cooled. Soon afterwards, the CPC Central Committee held two meetings in Zhengzhou at which the mistakes committed by the leftists were corrected. Mao repeatedly urged cadres at all levels to study political economics and explore the laws of economic construction. He himself set up a study group in Hangzhou. Starting in late 1959, he spent two months studying the Soviet text, Political Economy. Liu Xiaoxi, Zhou Enlai, and other senior leaders established similar study groups. Based on his own research, Mao observed that the law of value was a great school that should be used to serve socialist construction. In 
in January 1960, an enlarged meeting of the Political Bureau of the CPC Central Committee convened in Shanghai. On the last day of the meeting, Mao presented the text, Decade in Review. In it, he offered a preliminary assessment of the challenges faced by the People's Republic over the previous 10 years. He admitted, we still have insufficient experience in socialist construction. Remaining before us is a great, still unrecognized realm of necessity. We still do not have an in-depth understanding of it. He emphasized the need to continue to investigate and analyze economic construction in practice. We must seek out its constant rules, he said, and utilize these rules for the benefit of the socialist cause. In January 1961, the ninth plenary session of the 8th CPC Central Committee met in Beijing. Mao Zedong used the occasion to call on the entire party to help investigate and study and to spend a year seeking the truth from reality. In response, the entire Central Committee set out to gain first-hand experience of party work at the grassroots. Based on what they discovered about the situation on the ground, they created new policies designed to open a splendid new chapter of investigation and study. Mao Zedong personally organized three investigation groups, which were sent to villages in Zhejiang, Hunan, and Guangdong provinces. Liu Xiaoqi went to the city of Changsha and Ningxiang County in Hunan. Zhou Enlai went to Wu'an and Shexian counties in Handan Hebei. Zhu De toured the provinces of Sichuan, Shanxi, and Henan. Chen Yun went to Qingpu County in Shanghai. And Deng Xiaoping traveled to Shunyi and Huairo on the outskirts of Beijing. In January 1962, the CPC Central Committee convened a central working conference. A total of 7,000 representatives from all levels of the party from the county upwards attended. In a series of frank exchanges, they discussed the problems confronting them. Subsequently, a policy was introduced of readjustment, consolidation, filling gaps, and raising standards. This helped China adjust its economy and recover from the downturn. From late 1964 to early 1965, the first session of the Third National People's Congress was held in Beijing. For the first time, the goal was set of building China into a strong socialist country with modern agriculture, modern industry, modern national defenses, and modern science and technology. The meeting also confirmed the strategic goal of realizing industrialization in two stages. The two goals served as a major blueprint and motivation for uniting every ethnic group in the country in an unremitting struggle. By late 1965, the adjustments to the national economy were completed. Total industrial and agricultural output reach record highs. During this period, the external environment was marked by hostility, blockades, and isolation inflicted on China by the imperialist countries. There was also a deterioration in relations with the Soviet Union. The external situation had a major impact on the CPC's assessment of the domestic political landscape and on its decisions regarding the key tasks and policies the party and state should carry out. Mao Zedong, as the leader of a ruling proletarian party, was keenly interested in the real-life problems facing an emerging socialist society. He was extremely concerned that the party and people should consolidate their hard-won rule. He was alert to the danger of capitalism being revived and was constantly looking for new ways to eradicate corruption, privilege, and bureaucratism from within the party and government. However, the ideological and practical errors committed by the leftists finally erupted in the Cultural Revolution. This tumultuous period, which lasted for 10 years, was the most enduring, most far-reaching, and most destructive setback for the party, the country, and every ethnic group in it since 1949.
Ultimately, by relying on its inherent strength, the party was able to end the Cultural Revolution. Yet again, history proved the vitality of the CPC and the socialist system and testified to the CPC's ability to rectify its own mistakes. Even though it suffered during the Cultural Revolution, the national economy still made progress. Food production achieved relatively steady growth, and some major successes were recorded in industry, transport, basic construction, and science and technology. The party and people overcame the difficulties and continued to advance Chinese history. At 3.42 a.m. on July the 28th, 1976, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake struck Tangshan in Hebei province. The city was leveled and 240,000 people were killed and a further 160,000 injured. The greatest natural disaster suffered by China since 1949 devastated lives and property in what was an old center of industry. Under the leadership of the Central Committee and supported by soldiers and civilians from across the country, the people of Tangshan undertook a heroic disaster relief and rebuilding effort. The Communist Party of China, led by Mao Zedong, united people of every ethnicity, the entire party, and the whole country in the struggle against imperialism and feudalism. Together, they established the foundations of a socialist system and achieved initial success in socialist construction. They also gained useful experience in exploring the path of socialism with Chinese characteristics and created the conditions necessary for it. They established solid theoretical and practical foundations for the victorious advance of the party and the Chinese people, as well as for the Chinese nation to attain the same level of development as the rest of the world. This Chinese民族有史以来最为广泛而深刻的社会变革，为当代中国一切发展进步奠定了根本政治前提和制度基础，为中国发展富强、中国人民生活富裕奠定了坚实基础。The immortal contributions made by Mao Zedong and other revolutionaries to the Communist Party, to China, and to the Chinese nation will be inscribed for all eternity in the annals of the party and the country.
是多么的幸运，降生在你的怀里，我的血脉流淌着。就是我。